did you know Mean Girls is based on a book? Queen Bees and Wannabes by Rosalind Wiseman is a self-help book aimed at mothers of teenage girls. Wiseman is the co-founder and president of the Empower program, through which she teaches girls and boys to recognize the ways they are socialized into hostile, abusive, and violent behaviors. Queen Bees aims to share this knowledge with parents so they can understand how their daughters experience high school and what Wiseman calls girl world. That is to say, it is a non-fiction book without a plot or characters. So how, from this, do we get Mean Girls? The 2004 film about Katie Heron, a new arrival at North Shore High School, who is adopted by a popular clique known as the Plastics, and, oh come on, you know Mean Girls, I mean we're still quoting it today. On Wednesdays we wear pink. Mean Girls was written by and stars the comedian, writer, actor, best-selling author, Golden Globe host, and the Sarah Palin doppelganger you wouldn't shoot. And I can see Russia from my house. <laughs> Tina Fey. And Mean Girls is probably what she's most known for. It is, at least partially, based on Fey's own experience of high school. There was a girl when I was a freshman who said to me, You're like really pretty. Thank you. So you agree? What? You think you're really pretty? And I was like, it's a trap! <laughs> Faye has spoken openly about how she herself was a mean girl. The film is set in Faye's hometown. The character Damien is based on a real Damien who was Faye's friend in school. Katie is named after another friend, as is Glenn Coco. You go, Glenn Coco! Some of the film's discussion of female beauty standards is strikingly similar to passages of Faye's autobiography, Bossy Pants. I used to think there was just fat and skinny. Apparently there's a lot of things that can be wrong on your body. And the way Regina compliments girls on things she hates about them Oh my god, I love your skirt. That is the ugliest effing skirt I've ever seen. is based on a similar thing Faye's mother used to do. Aside from anything else, Mean Girls is written in Faye's distinctive voice. That's what makes it so quotable. Is butter a carb? It's like I have ESPN or something. She doesn't even go here! At first glance, it seems like the bulk of Mean Girls must have been invented by Faye. Sure, Queen Bees might have been the inspiration, but it's clearly transformed a lot in the process of adaptation, right? Well, let's have a look, shall we? Before we begin, two disclaimers. Pay attention, because these will be on the test. Disclaimer number one. All the quotes I've used from Queen Bees are taken from the 2002 edition, because that's presumably the one Faye had access to when she wrote Mean Girls. New editions have since been published that are quite different. Wiseman has updated some of her ideas, and added a lot of stuff about social media and the like. I hope it goes without saying that if you want to reconnect with your teenage daughter, that's not what this video is for. Actually, considering the amount of quotes I've used, it's only fair I give Queen Bees and Wannabes a soft plug here. It's a genuinely fascinating book. If you want to learn more about the ideas this video touches on, I recommend giving it a read. I'll put a non-Amazon link in the doobly-doo. Disclaimer number two. Though Queen Bees and Mean Girls have similar messages, they have different goals. Queen Bees wants to educate, Mean Girls wants to entertain. It is a comedy, and it is certainly unafraid of being funny just for the sake of it. There will be times when I point out aspects of Wiseman's ideas that Mean Girls omits or translates only in part. At times, I will offer an opinion on that. But generally, this is neither good nor bad. Mean Girls is not aiming to be authentic to Queen Bees. It's not necessarily wrong for it to draw inspiration from the book, but end up saying something slightly different. Everyone got all that? Good. Now get in, loser. We are going shopping on this biatch. Though Queen Bees may not have any real characters, it does have a lot of the raw material which can be fashioned into characters. Wiseman presents a lot of hypothetical situations with hypothetical teenage girls, some with names, some with short scripts of dialogue, to exemplify the social roles and dynamics that are common in girl world. 
Furthermore, Wiseman bolsters her arguments with testimonies she's collected from real girls and parents she's met through her Empower workshops. Some of these quotes have even been translated almost verbatim into the film's dialogue. It's like buying a shirt without your friend telling you whether you look good in it or not. You may like someone, but you could be wrong. Well, I mean, you wouldn't buy a skirt without asking your friends first if it looks good on you. Oh, and it's the same with guys. Like, you may think you like someone, but you could be wrong. The book paints such a rich impression of Girl World, it's easy to see why Faye felt it was worthy of adaptation. But if this is going to be a story, whose story is it? Being a self-help book, the closest thing Queen Bees has to a protagonist might be the reader themselves. Wiseman assumes she is speaking to the mother of a teenage girl. She often asks the reader to reflect on their own experiences at that age, and writes hypothetical conversations the reader might have with their daughter, including the reader in the quote-unquote narrative. As such, the reader's daughter might also be considered a character. She's described vaguely enough to represent any daughter, but she's referenced frequently. It is this relationship between mother and daughter which Wiseman is most concerned with. So, by the same logic, that would make Wiseman herself a character as well. She speaks directly to the reader and often relays her own experiences, involving herself in what she's describing. If the book does have a plot, it's the story of a mother whose relationship with her daughter has broken down, and Wiseman is teaching them how to repair that relationship. Which is not the plot of the film. Nevertheless, I suspect a framework similar to this formed the foundation of Faye's screenplay. And in my head, I was like, I could play Rosalind. She's the same age as me. But as I started to write, my part got tinier and tinier. In the final version of the film, Faye's character, Ms. Norbury, shares only a passing resemblance to Wiseman. Ms. Norbury offers some comic relief and a romantic subplot, but largely functions simply as the teacher, giving voice to our lead character's school performance. You know what's weird about your quizzes, Katie, is that all the work is right and just the answers are wrong. Nevertheless, Ms. Norbury often speaks with a version of Wiseman's voice. People often blame girls' low self-esteem as the root cause for the problems girls face. I respectfully disagree, and I'm asking you to look at it another way. There has to be something that you can say to these young ladies, something to help them with their self-esteem. It's not a self-esteem problem. I think they're all pretty pleased with themselves. Where Miss Norbury most embodies Wiseman is during her workshop, which is loosely based on Wiseman's Empower workshops. I start the class by asking the girls to close their eyes and answer by a show of hands. I want you to raise your hand if you have ever had a girl say something bad about you behind your back. All hands immediately shoot up. I ask the girls to keep their hands up and open their eyes. Open your eyes. They laugh. Then I have them close their eyes again. And this time, I want you to raise your hand if you have ever said anything about a friend behind her back. Much more slowly, some bending from the elbow instead of extending their hand, all the hands go up. Open them. They laugh again, but nervously. Uh, it's been some girl-on-girl -girl crime here. Writing confessions onto notes is also similar to Wiseman's workshops, although with Wiseman this is done anonymously. Aside from that, this is where the similarities end. I do not do trust falls. I have never done trust falls. It would be easy to write Wiseman into the story as a Mary Poppins-style character who floats in and solves teenage girlhood, but that's not really what the book is about. Rather, Wiseman shines a light on how girl culture reinforces common problems, and that's really what Miss Norbury is doing. At times, it is useful to contextualise things with Wiseman's perspective, identifying that these problems are not unique to these characters, but exist in the culture. And it seems like every clique had its own problems. Okay, but even without Wiseman, it would still be a more natural adaptation for the story to focus on the relationship between a mother and daughter. Queen Bees is a self-help book for parents. Naturally, it talks a lot about parenting. And some of that is parroted in the film. So not like a regular mom, I'm a cool mom. The hip parent. This parent will do anything to be liked by the daughter and her friends, believing that if the kids are going to drink, they may as well do it under their own roof. Is there alcohol in this? <gasps> oh god, honey, no. What kind of mother do you think I am? <laughs> Why do you want a little bit? Because if you're going to drink, I'd rather you do it in the house. Easily manipulated and disrespected by their children, especially in front of others. Please stop talking. Okay. It may be that Katie's relationship with her mother was more of a focus in earlier drafts. 
there's a deleted scene about Katie and her mother's failure to communicate. These are on sale. These are well made. Those are hideous. I don't think those are appropriate. Which closely mimics one of Wiseman's hypotheticals, and concisely sums up her major points about it. Remember, it's never just about the shoes. Nevertheless, it's easy to see why this scene was deleted. Though Katie's relationship with her mother does break down. I don't know what to believe anymore. Mom, believe me, I'm your daughter. Unlike the book, it's not the relationship the film is most concerned with. The book may be aimed at mothers, but it is about girl world. It aims to inform mothers about a place and culture they are not privy to. But if you want to write a film about girl world, we need to see it. You need to set the story there. And the more scenes you have involving the mother, the fewer you have in the setting the film is actually interested in. The reader's daughter may not be the viewpoint character of the book, but it is her story. So Faye centers the film on a daughter. Unfortunately, presenting girl world from her perspective creates its own problems. The mother's viewpoint is objective, but her daughter's is not. She is part of the culture the film wants to investigate. But it's harder to examine something when viewed from the inside. That's why many protagonists are recent arrivals to the setting, so the audience can learn things as they do. Which is precisely how Faye solves this problem. But Katie is not only new to the school, she's new to school in general, having been homeschooled her entire life. She can have girl world explained to her in much the same way Wiseman disseminates it for her reader. The book aims to tell parents how the world looks through their daughter's eyes, but the advantage of fiction is that you can just show that perspective. What's more, this decision presents other opportunities which aid adaptation. Firstly, Faye makes Katie the child of zoologists, being homeschooled because she grew up in Africa. The script says Namibia, but Africa is as specific as the film gets. By giving Katie a zoology background, she can observe the culture of girl world in the style of a nature documentary. Being at Old Orchard Mall kind of reminded me of being home in Africa, by the watering hole, and the animals are in heat. Which mimics Wiseman's perspective of girl world. Tina came down and hung out with me. I said to her, I look at this like a watering hole where you've got the predators. That's the way I look at group dynamics with young people. She takes that and makes an incredible scene out of it. A lot of Queen Bees is about deconstructing teenagers' words and behaviours to identify what they truly think and feel. Katie regarding her classmates as wildlife is another way of exposing those hidden meanings. <laughs> But the biggest advantage of having Katie begin as an outsider to girl world from an adaptation standpoint is that it sets up a character arc for Katie which is ideal for demonstrating Wiseman's ideas. Welcome to the wonderful world of your daughter's adolescence. Ten seconds ago she was a sweet, confident, world-beaten little girl who looked up to you. Now she's changing before your very eyes. She's confused, insecure, often surly, lashing out. Katie begins not just as an outsider, but, emotionally speaking, pre-adolescent having no knowledge of adult concepts like alcohol, sex, or sex appeal. You're a regulation hottie. What? But when placed into this competitive environment, she has to grow up fast. She is co-opted and corrupted by girl world, participating in a cycle of abuse. Katie's arc is a microcosm of what Wiseman describes as a typical experience of high school for a teenage girl, concluding in the outcome the book aims to help girls achieve. Katie breaks the cycle of abuse and achieves true emotional maturity. Structuring Katie's arc in this way makes the broader point of the book, whilst also providing a convenient framework to house the book's more specific ideas. Now all Faye has to do is slot in whichever of Wiseman's points and observations most interest her. So we have our lead character and her arc. Let's build on that by placing it in the context of our setting. Trapped in the life raft. I know this is a dramatic metaphor to demonstrate girls' fear, but it shows how trapped many girls feel, forced to be a certain way in order to be accepted by their peers. They perceive that their only choices are to be trapped in the life raft or thrown into the water. To girls, the life raft of the clique can truly feel like a matter of life and death. Of all the chapters in Queen Bees, Mean Girls takes most direct influence from chapter one, cliques and popularity which is all about the social dynamics of cliques and how they dominate the high school landscape. Sometimes 
in a very literal sense. In this chapter, Wiseman includes two high school maps, drawn by real girls from her Empower workshops, to show how a high school looks through their eyes, how corridors and cafeterias become territory for the tribes that roam there. Even taking the wrong path might land you into danger, just how Katie is ensnared by the plastics simply for walking past their table. These maps strongly resemble the map Janice gives to Katie when she first arrives at North Shore. They paint a similar picture of harsh social divides, centered around sports, extracurriculars, social exile, sexual activity, body image, and, most uncomfortably, race. At this point, I should quickly acknowledge criticisms of Tina Fey's handling of race in her work. Mean Girls has its fair share of race-based humor. Maybe a little too much. But it has been particularly criticized for portraying its Asian characters as hypersexual, as well as muddling different Asian and African cultures. I won't comment too much on this, because it's mostly not relevant to the subject of adaptation. Though Wiseman writes a lot about how race intersects with the issues she covers, Mean Girls mostly doesn't engage with that side of it, and that might be for the best. The one exception is the book's observation that cliques can be centered on race. Mean Girls reflects this, but with little deconstruction. Faye might be attempting to challenge the racial aspect of clique culture, or at least acknowledge it, by having Gretchen integrate with the Asian clique at the film's conclusion, suggesting once Girl World is toppled, it no longer reinforces these divisions. Which is a simplistic interpretation of Wiseman's arguments, but then this is a very minor plot point. Whether paying lip service to this real racial issue is better or worse than ignoring it altogether is not my place to say. If you want to leave a comment about it, please keep it civil. What Mean Girls mainly lifts from Wiseman's chapter on cliques are the social politics within and between the groups. After five minutes or so, without exception, the following occurs. A girl, usually generically pretty and surrounded by four or five girls, will raise her hand defiantly and say, Can I just say that we don't have a clique problem at this school? As she's speaking, there are many expressions of disbelief and eye-rolling from the other girls in the room. Without exception, three things will be true about this girl. First, she'll always be one of the meanest, most exclusive girls in the room. Second, she honestly believes what she's saying. Third, her parents will be in total denial about how mean she is. How many of you have ever felt personally victimized by Regina George? Wiseman describes a social hierarchy, enumerating seven different roles girls can occupy within it. In later editions, Wiseman has rejigged this list into eight slightly different roles, but naturally it's the original seven which are reflected in the film, and none more deliberately than... She's the Queen Bee. I call her the Queen Bee. Through a combination of charisma, force, money, looks, will, and manipulation, this girl reigns supreme. Your daughter is a Queen Bee if her friends do what she wants to do, she isn't intimidated by any other girl in her class, she can argue anyone down, including friends, peers, teachers, and parents, she can make another girl feel anointed by declaring her a special friend. She won't take responsibility when she hurts someone's feelings. If she's been wronged, she feels she has the right to seek revenge. The Queen Bee has the most power within the group. Everyone else's social position depends on her. Gaining her approval grants you more power, but also means abiding by and enforcing the law of the clique as she lays down. We have rules about what we wear. You can only wear your hair up, like in a ponytail, for once a week. You can't wear a tank top two days in a row. If you break any of these rules, you can't sit with us at lunch. You can't wear a tank top two days in a row, and you can only wear your hair in a ponytail once a week. But if you break any of these rules, you can't sit with us at lunch. Gretchen's role is the sidekick. She is the minion Regina sends to do her dirty work. Regina wanted me to give you this. Of all the plastics, her identity and status is most defined by Regina, and Gretchen is devastated when she fears she's lost Regina's approval. However, Gretchen doesn't fit into this role comfortably. Though she does modify her behavior at the Queen Bee's behest, like refraining from using slang Regina doesn't like. Gretchen, stop trying to make fetch happen. It's not going to happen. She's not happy about it, which reflects how restrictive these roles can be. Despite her frustrations, Gretchen still craves Regina's approval, because everything she is depends on having it. Regina, wait, talk to me. Well, almost everything. 
Gretchen's other role is the banker. She exerts power over her peers by hoarding sensitive information about them. She knows everything about everyone. That's why her hair is so big, it's full of secrets. Hey, hey. Wiseman characterizes this role as more Machiavellian than Gretchen is. The banker uses secrets to generate conflict or manipulate others, whereas Gretchen is more like a gossip who is bad at keeping secrets. Oh my god, why didn't you didn't hear that? But while she's not skilled enough at this to gain much power by it, on occasion she uses it vindictively to reclaim some of the power Regina has over her. Make sure you check out her mom's boob job. Karen's role is trickiest to identify. She's more of a comic relief character, her primary trait being she's dumb. But being an empty vessel is evocative of the pleaser wannabe messenger role. Whilst the approval of the clique may influence all its members, this girl mimics her peers to such an extent she has very little concept of who she actually is. Well, there must be something you're good at. I can put my whole fist in my mouth. Wanna see? Yeah. She hasn't figured out who she is or what she values. She's constantly anticipating what people want from her and doesn't ask herself what she wants in return. Karen tends to just agree with the others. I think I'm joining the mathletes. No, no, no. You cannot do that. That is social suicide. Damn, you are so lucky you have us to guide you. Which places her in the middle of conflicts, acting as a go-between for the injured parties. Let's go out. Okay, hold on. I'm on the other line with Gretchen. Don't invite Gretchen. She's driving me nuts. It's Regina. She wants to hang out with me tonight, but she told me not to tell you. Of the three OG plastics, Karen is lowest on the pecking order, which makes her place in the clique most precarious, teetering on the edge of becoming the target. When a clique rallies against a girl who has broken their social law, that girl becomes the target, an object of ridicule and exclusion. In Mean Girls, the most obvious example of this is Janice. Once a member of the Plastics, or a middle school version of them, she was exiled from the group after losing the Queen Bee's approval. However, it's also important to note Wiseman says these roles are not unique to the popular crowd. Janice and Damien's clique, what Gretchen calls the art freaks, is subject to the same social hierarchy. Here, Janice is the Queen Bee. In this group, she is the one with most social power. Can you just do it, please? Okay, fine. So it is just as true to say, in the social hierarchy of the art freaks, Regina is the target, even more so than Janice is to the plastics. But it is also, also important to note, Wiseman describes the target as not necessarily outside of the clique. Sometimes a social order is maintained by keeping somebody at the bottom. A target may endure humiliation and abuse because it's better than being thrown out of the life raft. The meaner Regina was to her, the more Gretchen tried to win Regina back. She knew it was better to be in the plastics, hating life, than to not be in at all. This is also true of Katie. When she is first inducted into the plastics, there's a sense the reason they let her in is because they are baffled and amused by her. Katie, do you even know who sings this? Um, the Spice Girls? <laughs> I love her. She's like a Martian. This is the key thing to understand about these roles. They are flexible. It is possible to be multiple roles at once, and though they are difficult to escape, they can change. Girls can switch roles. Wannabes can become targets. Bankers can become queen bees. Switching usually happens at the beginning of the school year or when a new student arrives. Katie is the catalyst for revolution. Her arrival upsets the existing social order. Over the course of the film, Katie rises through the ranks of all seven roles. I know it's wrong to skip class, but Janice said we were friends, and I was in no position to pass up friends. She's not going out with anyone. <laughs> okay, that was so <laughs> fetch. <laughs> Gretchen, switch sides with Katie. The whole dance will be backwards. I'm always on your left. She's cheating on you. What? Katie, she's not pretty. I mean, that sounds bad, but whatever. Well, she's not mad at you. Was I the new Queen Bee? Do you know what everyone says about you? Katie's crimes land her as the target for the entire school. But while this is no picnic for Katie, it is, at least, educational. There's nothing like being targeted to teach your daughter about empathy and understanding for people who are bullied and or discriminated against. She can see the costs of fitting in and decide she's better off outside the clique. 
And with this lesson, Katie assumes the seventh and most desirable role, the floater. Because in the metaphor of the life raft, the best thing to do is float. School used to be like a shark tank, but now I could just float. The floater is not beholden to a single clique and can float between them. She has less power over others than a queen bee does, but it's still always better because the queen bee has less sense of self. Katie had to sacrifice her identity to become queen bee. As the floater, she doesn't have to do that. Her peers like her for who she is as a person. She'll be less likely to sacrifice herself to gain and keep social status. By the film's conclusion, everyone is a floater. The cliques aren't gone exactly. Wiseman even says cliques are natural and can be supportive. What's gone is the exclusivity. Everyone can move freely between different social groups without fear of judgment or exile. Now, this is a utopian ideal which may not be possible in reality. In Queen Bees, Wiseman's goal is to help girls recognize the culture rather than overturn it. And even Mean Girls makes it clear the culture has not been eradicated. Check it out, Junior Plastics. But by concluding the film in this way, Faye presents this as the goal girl world should be aspiring towards, making Wiseman's point that cliques create a divisive culture. As soon as you define your role in group, you perceive others as outsiders. It's harder to put yourself in their shoes, and therefore it's either to be cruel to them or watch and do nothing. So we have our characters, and we've put them in the treacherous waters of clique culture. To get a plot, all we need to do now is throw these bloodthirsty piranhas some meat. Understand that your daughter still lives in a culture where boyfriends are crucial validation for three interrelated reasons. They increase her sense of self-worth, her friends will hold her in high esteem, and a boyfriend is proof that she fits into teen culture. In Faye's original script, there was much more explicit sexual content. Amber D'Alessio didn't just make out with a hot dog, she with one. But this was toned down to get a PG-13 rating. That said, the film still emulates many of Wiseman's observations of sexual politics. They want to check out the whole boy thing and be involved in the drama, but without putting themselves on the front line. In many different ways, girls push each other to be the first one to jump off the cliff. Hey, good job, Africa. Thanks. Oh, Katie's blushing. Oh my god, you totally have a crush on that guy. No, I don't. Gretchen is the worst for this type of behavior, wishing romance into existence even when it isn't there. It's not just that she wants to know the gossip, she also wants to push her friends into relationships. What's up? Gretchen came to talk to me. Oh no. Perhaps that is why she told Regina about Katie's crush on Aaron. Perhaps if she hadn't pressed Katie to reveal this information in the first place, a lot of drama could have been avoided. Getting together with another girl's boyfriend is one of the most common conflicts between girls. Regina's decision to take Aaron back is clearly not about any genuine interest in Aaron. She was hooking up with Shane Oman before, during, and after her relationship with Aaron. No, this is a clear power move directed at Katie. Queen Bees are careful to regulate the popularity of other girls. The girl set up for her first boyfriend, and hence her moment in the sun as the focus of attention, is beholden and bonded to the Queen Bee. The Queen Bee can also influence when a girl stops liking the boy. It may be that Regina genuinely intended to speak to Aaron on Katie's behalf, because the gesture helps maintain her power. It's only when she realizes Aaron might genuinely reciprocate Katie's feelings that she seems to change her mind. You know that girl Katie? Yeah, she's cool. I invited her tonight. Well, be careful, because she has a huge crush on you. Aaron is a popular senior, and therefore raises the social status of whichever girl he's in a relationship with. Perhaps Regina was concerned that if Katie dated Aaron, Katie's social profile might rival Regina's own. The girls of higher social status feel like this girl, who isn't as cool or pretty as they are, takes their guys. They feel threatened. Because of Regina. Because you were her, her property. Her property. The plan to split up Regina and Aaron was not just about getting Aaron together with Katie, but also because Aaron is part of what gives Regina her power. Regina would be nothing without her high status man candy. To Regina, Aaron is just another pawn she can manipulate in the politics of girl world. But Katie believes the exact same thing. She blames Regina entirely, never considering Aaron's agency in what happened. No matter who in the new couple took the initiative, 
Rarely do girls blame the boy as much as the girl, if they blame him at all. Like Regina, Katie treats Aaron as an object, a prize she manipulates away from Regina and towards herself, as if Aaron is helpless to resist the advances of any girl who throws herself at him. Girls will excuse his behaviour by saying that the girl was all over him. She was being a slut, and what was he supposed to do? Who here has ever been called a slut? In Mean Girls, whenever anyone calls somebody else a slut, it has less to do with the behaviour of the accused and more to do with the accuser's own feelings. Be it jealousy, <gasps> slut, resentment, she may seem like your typical selfish, backstabbing, slut faced hoe bag, or superiority. Regina says everyone hates you because you're such a slut. She said that? The fear of being accused of acting like a slut controls girls' actions in a particular situation. For example, when your daughter chooses what to wear to a party, she's trying to balance looking sexy while not coming off as slutty, i.e. being attractive to boys yet not incurring the wrath of other girls. Girls accuse each other of seeking male attention, whilst secretly craving it themselves. Any overt displays of sexuality will be interpreted as a threat. As such, the only way girls can explore their sexuality safely is to find loopholes. Halloween immunity. These situations are ceasefires in girls' battles with each other, where they get to dress as sexy as possible with less fear of recrimination. Like it or not, she's test driving her power. In girl world, Halloween is the one night a year when a girl can dress like a total slut and no other girls can say anything about it. <sighs> what are you? I'm a mouse. Duh. Katie, however, finds a different loophole. Hey, um, I'm totally lost. Can you help me? But I wasn't lost. Yeah. I knew exactly what Miss Norbury was talking about. At some point, a girl will pretend to not be as smart, strong, or capable around a boy she likes. She may be embarrassed by her behavior, but not know how to stop. Wiseman calls this behavior the fruit cup girl, based on a story from one of her empower girls who pretended to be unable to open a fruit cup in order to get help from a guy she liked. It's not necessarily about acting dumb, it can be about acting dainty or silly, performing a gendered stereotype to get male attention. Because it works. But once you start, it's difficult to stop. And if you're always playing the fool, you'll start to feel like one. Mathletes, you hate math. Oh, look how red she is. However, what Faye omits from Wiseman's observations of all these behaviours is how they put girls at risk of sexual violence or abuse, blaming other girls instead of supporting them, not holding boys accountable for their behaviour, using alcohol as an excuse to behave the fruit cup girl. Faye borrows enough from Wiseman that she veers close to these issues, but stops short of actually addressing them. For instance, in her chapter on parties, Wiseman describes the party from hell, which is strikingly similar to the party Katie throws. Nikki's parents are going away for the weekend, leaving Nikki alone in the house for the first time. Anna and Greer convince Nikki to have a party that Saturday night and invite all their friends, including Colin, on whom Nikki has a huge crush. Aaron Samuels was going to be in my house, at my party. Everything had to be perfect. The doorbell's ringing again. More people are coming. Nikki isn't sure she recognizes the group of guys, but they greet Anna and Greer like family. She lets them in. Do I know you? Hey, Dee! What up, dog? Nikki is miserable. She just went into her parents' room Get out. and found two random people in their bed. Ali is now sitting on Derek's lap, still playing drinking games. Anna walks into the kitchen. Derek, can I talk to you for a minute? It's important. I have to talk to you. What? They talk intensely. Anna falls apart crying and Derek tells her that he still cares a lot about her but wants to be able to do his own thing. Anna starts to drink a lot of punch. While she's drinking, she thinks, How could he do this to me? Do I mean nothing to him? Was Aaron blowing me off? Derek asks Ali if she'll go upstairs so they can talk privately. They go to a bedroom. You want to go downstairs? No, no, let's stay here. He closes the door, locks it, so we can be alone, and sits on the bed with her. The point of Wiseman's story is to show how easily girls can find themselves in this situation. All the other girls present are drunk, busy with their own drama, or distracted by girl world politics. Nobody is looking out for Ali, which leaves her inebriated, separated from the herd, and locked in a room with a boy. And maybe she'll be fine. Or maybe she won't. In that situation, girls will almost always do what the other person wants, including having sex against their will.
Whereas Mean Girls imagines the worst thing that can happen is embarrassing yourself by vomiting on the guy's lap. <laughs> Perhaps the party scene is a relic from an older draft, which followed Wiseman's example more closely. In the final film, nothing really comes of Regina walking in on them. Perhaps the original intention was that she'd inadvertently save Katie, putting their petty squabble into perspective, like being hit by a school bus does. Then again, even Faye's original, more explicit draft ends the party in the same way the finished film does. Perhaps Faye simply wanted a party set piece and used building blocks from Wiseman's example. A lot of it is fairly common teen party tropes, after all. Either way, the decision to omit the most crucial detail of Wiseman's party from hell is surely a conscious choice. The boys of Mean Girls are pretty benign, not to mention fairly simple characters. Aaron is a nice guy, Jason is a bit of an asshole, Kevin G is kinda sexist, but too much of a nerd to actually be dangerous. Though Wiseman talks a lot about what we would now call toxic masculinity, and even writes a whole chapter on Boy World, very little of that makes it into the film. Maybe it's a little irresponsible to ignore the subject of male violence. Then again, a PG-13 teen comedy might not be the best vehicle to discuss it, at least not in that kind of detail. Instead, Faye hints at the subject as part of a broader cultural issue. You all have got to stop calling each other sluts and whores. It just makes it okay for guys to call you sluts and whores. It would be difficult to confront such a charged topic without that becoming the focus, the thesis statement of the film becoming something like, women have to support each other as protection against male violence. Which is a point Wiseman makes, but it's not the main point of the book. To decide which aspects of a complex issue to include in a narrative, it helps to be guided by a theme. And the side of Wiseman's observation Faye seems most interested in is girls' relationships with other girls, and how that perpetuates a toxic culture. Our culture teaches girls a very dangerous and confusing code of behaviour about what constitutes appropriate feminine behaviour. We like to blame the media and boys for enforcing this code, but we overlook the girls themselves as the enforcers. The film is only interested in boys insofar as how they affect the ways girls treat each other. Sure, Katie only agrees to Janice's revenge plan because of Aaron, but in the end, it becomes about more than just him. Aaron Samuels, for example, he broke up with Regina, and guess what? He still doesn't want you. So why are you still messing with Regina, Katie? I'll tell you why, because you are a mean girl! Naturally, Wiseman has much to say about why girls turn mean, but in choosing the themes for the film, there's one theme in Wiseman's work which seems to interest Faye most of all. Another exercise from Wiseman's Empower workshops is the Act Like a Woman box. Wiseman has the girls list the traits that affect a girl's social status. Desirable traits are placed inside the box, undesirable traits are placed outside thus identifying the behaviour girl world values and encourages, as well as the transgressions which will get you shunned. It's this which decides the pecking order of the cliques, though some girls are perfectly happy existing outside the box, and some cliques may even define themselves by these undesirable traits, everyone is still beholden to the culture. Even those most harmed by it may uphold it just as much as those who benefit. I think I'm joining the mathletes. No. No, no, no. You cannot do that. That is social suicide. You can't join mathletes, it's social suicide. You cannot escape the culture. So you either comply or rebel. Katie complies. She learns how to benefit from girl world by modeling herself after Regina. You are just like a clone of Regina. But this version of herself is an image she's constructed, without being fully conscious that's what she's been conditioned to do. As far as Katie is concerned, she's pretending. It's a persona she's putting on in pursuit of her revenge. But when that revenge is achieved, the persona doesn't come off anymore. Somewhere along the way, girls start believing their own press. Who they are, their character, sense of self and personality gets tangled up with their reputation and image. Hey buddy, you're not pretending anymore, you're plastic. Cold, shiny, hard plastic. Janice, on the other hand, has rebelled. Even so, what she's doing is not all that different. Similar to how Regina is clearly based on Wiseman's Queen Bee archetype, there are clear inspirations for Janice peppered throughout the book. In eighth grade, there was a girl in my clique no one liked. One of the girls spread a rumor that she was a lesbian with another girl in her class. 
I hate to admit it, but I was mean to her too. She was forced out and then she started having sex with all these guys. Her parents didn't know what happened, but they knew something was wrong. So they took her out of school and homeschooled her. Wiseman observes that cliques are at their worst in middle school, because as girls enter adolescence, they feel the need to figure out their identities and where they fit in society. When Janice and Regina were in middle school, it seems they developed in different directions, which caused their friendship to fray. So it wasn't just one thing that led to the breakup. Accounts of their history is basically a hit list of all the worst things Wiseman says can happen when girls fight. When we were 13, she made people sign this petition saying that Janice was- Damien, please! Like, if I would blow her off to hang out with Kyle, she'd be like, why didn't you call me back? So then for my birthday party, which was an all girls pool party, I was like, Janice, I can't invite you because I think you're a lesbian. I mean, I couldn't have a lesbian at my party. So then her mom called my mom and started yelling at her. It was so <laughs> And then she dropped out of school because no one would talk to her. When she came back in the fall for high school, all of her hair was cut off and she was totally weird. And now I guess she's on crack. As a direct result of being ostracized, Janice changed her image entirely. Similar to the roles of the clique, Wiseman lists a number of reputations, or images, a girl might adopt, or more likely, be ascribed by others. Of these, Janice is a combination of two. The in-your-face angry girl. She's not afraid to dress differently and be bitchy. She has no patience for popularity and the people in the popular cliques. Notwithstanding her hard exterior, she's easily hurt by others and feels like the world is against her. And the lesbian butch. Some girls have adopted a butch look because that's how they feel most comfortable. Some adopt the look to desexualize themselves. The decision to conclude the film with Janice in a heterosexual relationship has often been criticized because Janice is strongly queer coded. She presents as alternative. She's named after a lesbian musician. She's frequently the victim of homophobic slurs. She spends most of the film rebuffing male attention. And yet her story ends with her macking on a boy. It's almost played for a joke. Did Regina think she was a lesbian because she misheard Janice's heritage? You Puerto Rican? Lebanese. Lebanese is the same letters, but it's still a shock ending. You're supposed to come out as a lesbian. We're supposed to be kissing. This criticism is very valid. Enough that the musical adaptation felt the need to change this ending and make it semi-explicit that, yes, Janice is a lesbian. I think that's a good change. It works for the character, and as a gay man, I champion representation. So it brings me no pleasure to say, however. To be clear, I am not about to argue that Janice should be straight. I'm just observing that the motivation behind queer coding a straight character might have some basis from the book. Of all the characters, I suspect Janice is the one most modelled on Faye's younger self. Janice's arc of getting sucked into the revenge, I think like that was definitely me. So it may be that Janice is straight simply because Faye is straight and she didn't think to do otherwise. Or it may be that because Faye connected with Wiseman's descriptions of girls like Janice, Faye is trying to emulate Wiseman's observations of the role homophobia plays in creating Janice's. Wiseman talks at some length about homosexuality, mainly advice to parents of lesbian daughters. But she also talks about how homophobia is systemic in the culture of girl world. Generally, it's not so much if you really are a lesbian, but how you present yourself. If you're more masculine in appearance, people will give you a harder time than if you look feminine. Whether a girl is or isn't gay is less important than if and when homophobia is used as a weapon against a girl to put her down and isolate her. It's a little more evocative of how genuine homophobia works if, instead of simply making fun of Janice for being gay, Regina is conferring gayness upon Janice as a means of exerting power over her. At a time when Regina was in the process of constructing her own image, one that would become reflective of the ideal as determined by the act like a woman box, she pushed Janice outside the box as a form of control and used her influence to convince others to do the same. After being excluded, Janice responded by excluding the clique in return, excluding what they represent. I hate girls. You can't trust them. Girls are petty, stupid and jealous. Kate doesn't trust girls and she has good reason not to. They have rejected her. 
In her mind, all girls are bad. Janice embraces the reputation she's been given, so it can no longer be used to hurt her. Janice presents as queer coded in order to co-opt Regina's attack and reclaim some of the power Regina took from her. Probably because I've got a big lesbian crush on you. Suck on that! Which, granted, is a thing queer people often do as well. I'm not surprised many queer people identify with Janice. And as Wiseman says, whether or not Janice is actually gay has very little to do with Regina's actions. It's the same power move either way. So why not just make Janice gay? Well, perhaps by presenting Janice as straight, Faye was trying to make the point that Janice's image is just as constructed as everybody else's. It's more rooted in what Regina did to her than it is to Janice's authentic identity. Now, none of this invalidates the criticism. This can be both a point about image as well as queer erasure. And while I feel Janice does emulate ideas in the book, I'm not sure Faye communicates them entirely effectively. Unlike most of the other characters, Janice's image is not deconstructed by the end of the film. If her image is meant to be inauthentic, shouldn't she have grown beyond it in some way when Girl World was overthrown? Even if Faye is making a point about image, I'd argue ending Janice in a relationship is still not the best conclusion. Partly because one thing Faye overlooks from Wiseman's observations is how homophobia drives straight girls into unhealthy and unsafe relationships with boys. The consequence is that girls in this position are pressured to prove their heterosexuality. But mainly because I feel what Janice needs to learn is who she is as an individual, independent of her relation to others. Defining yourself in opposition to Girl World is still letting Girl World define you. Janice has been hurt, and the experience changed her. She's still carrying a lot of resentment, which is like a poison. It spreads. It's Janice who encourages Katie to seek revenge, which leads to Katie treating Janice in much the same way Regina did. Once again, Janice is excluded by a friend who was careless with their friendship and it prompts Regina to take her own revenge, which ends up hurting everybody. I think Janice kind of deserves the blame for that too, because her revenge was always going to pan out this way. Don't forget, publishing the Burn book was originally Janice's idea. We could publish it and then everybody would see what an axe wound she really is. Neither Janice, Regina, or even Katie care who else gets hurt in their quests for revenge, even if it's everybody. All three of them believe themselves to be entirely morally justified. There are two kinds of evil people. People who do evil stuff and people who see evil stuff being done and don't try to stop it. Some of us shouldn't have to take this workshop because some of us are just victims in this situation. You're the one who made me like this so you could use me for your eighth grade revenge. Morgan vowed revenge, although she assured me her behavior was morally correct because it was only equal to what she did to me. Each of them constructs an image that is flattering to themselves, because that's what Girl World encourages them to do. It allows them to justify mean behavior, to gain or reclaim power within Girl World, at the cost of their identities. It is only by giving up their power that they can free themselves of the power Girl World has over them. To break the cycle of revenge, they must take responsibility for themselves and what they've done. You can help your daughter develop a strong sense of self. You can teach her personal responsibility, confidence in her abilities, and empathy towards others. You want her to be an authentic person, able to realize her full individual potential while being connected to her loved ones and community. When I first had the idea for this video, I just thought it might be interesting to compare the book to the film. But in my research, I found out a bit more about Rosalind Wiseman that I feel would be dishonest not to include. While she has spoken very positively about the film itself, it seems she's not been treated very well by the filmmaking process. According to Wiseman, when she sold the rights to her book, she received a sizable advance, $440,000, as well as the promise of 5% of the film's profits, assuming it made a profit. Which, Wiseman was told, it still hasn't. I'm not going to pretend to know the ins and outs of Paramount's finances, 
but that's a little hard to believe. I imagine this is due to some dodgy fine print. According to Wiseman, when she sought legal advice, her lawyers laughed when they saw her contract. I'm told it's now being used as an example for what not to do. Wiseman also says she's received nothing from the Broadway musical. Even apart from proceeds, Wiseman had hoped to use the musical as a vehicle for her workshops, to combat a rising trend of bigotry she was noticing in schools, owing to the political situation. And while Paramount initially made plans with Wiseman to fund this, it all fell apart by the time the musical opened, leaving Wiseman's organisation with all the expenses for the work they'd done. Throughout all this, according to Wiseman, Faye had been on good terms with Wiseman, had been very vocal about Wiseman's work as the inspiration for Mean Girls, and had even promised to advocate for Wiseman after learning about these problems. However, at some point, Faye stopped responding to Wiseman's emails. I want to stress, the reason Wiseman has not been more vocal about this is because of how easily the story could be memeified into a feud between two women. Tina Fey is the real Regina George, says Mean Girls author, or something to that effect, which is at odds with Wiseman's goals. She wants to be supportive of other women. And while Wiseman's story raises questions about Fey's actions, Fey is not ultimately responsible. The real issue is how the Hollywood machine treats writers. Now, I'm not a legal expert. I only have Wiseman's side of the story, and there may well be more to this that we don't know. So I'm not going to take a strong stance on this. I'm just paraphrasing things Wiseman has said because it's relevant. What I will say is that it's a shame Wiseman's role in the film is not better known. I was surprised at quite how much of Mean Girls is reflected in Queen Bees. Every few pages, there's another clear inspiration for one of the film's iconic moments. I haven't even mentioned all of them. It's tempting for girls to have conference calls where one girl listens to the conversation without the knowledge of another. I guess she just likes the attention. See, Gretch, I told you she's not mad at you. I can't believe you think I like attention. So it saddens me to think that many people don't even realize Mean Girls is an adaptation. The film is still its own thing, of course. It's very different from the book, and there are whole chapters it misses out. Tina Fey certainly deserves credit for her skill at adaptation. She didn't go with the obvious choices, and the film is stronger for it. At the same time, I think a huge part of why Mean Girls is so popular is because it's built on Wiseman's observations. There's something very recognisable here, which people connect with. It wouldn't be what it is if it weren't for Rosalind Wiseman. So, the next time you watch Mean Girls, I hope you'll remember. Beneath all the quotable lines and timeless gags, beneath the set pieces and soundtrack, beneath the characters, setting, plot, and themes, there is another woman's voice. And she has something to say. This video was made with the support of my patrons. I really do rely on your support, so if you want to see more videos like this, please consider joining. That's patreon.com slash James Woodall. You can also support me at ko-fi.com slash James Woodall, or follow me on Twitter at James B. Woodall. Don't forget to comment, like, share, and subscribe. And thanks for watching. <laughs>